just want to say a couple of things about Anthony Beaver. Um, to simplify somewhat, among great historians, there seem to me to be two principal kinds. Those who try to explain why things happened in the past. Why was there French Revolution? Why did the First World War occur? And those who, uh, through scholarship, artistry and imagination, recreate the past. Anthony Beaver is, in my view, a great historian, and I don't say that lightly, and he is, I think, of the second kind, a recreator. His central interest, as I think everyone here will know, is the recreation of some of the central episodes of the overwhelmingly most savage military struggle in the history of humankind, the Second World War. He came, I think, to international attention with the masterpiece Stalingrad. He followed this with the astonishing history of downfall of the Third Reich, uh, Berlin. And more recently, he's published books on two of the military struggles that fell between these two events, first D-Day and this year, Ardennes 1944, Hitler's last gamble. Anyhow, it's my privilege today to, I, and I mean it genuinely, to be able to ask you some very general questions about um, history, the writing of history, and will lead to some of your, some of your work. But anyhow, I'd like to w welcome you here. And I'm going to ask some very, very basic questions. And the, the first one is um, uh, when and why you were drawn to history. Well, careers are very, very strange things. Um, when I was small, I had something called Perthes disease, which meant I was on crutches. And uh, what I hadn't realized at the time was I'd got a terrible chip on my shoulder, a uh, physical chip on my shoulder. And so um, I then later on found I was desperate to join the army and I became a professional army officer and all the rest of it. And in a rather ironic way, after five years in the army, I was, had to go off and do a very boring job. And because my mother's side of the family had all been writers, I thought, well, why can't I be a writer too? And so with the innocence and arrogance of youth, I started to write, um, even though I was totally unjustified, I mean, un unqualified for it. And I started off with writing one or two um, novels, but I had studied military history under John Keegan at Sandhurst. And publishers then sort of said, well, hang on, why don't you um, do start writing military history? Uh, and so in a sort of totally unplanned way, th it began. And that's why I started actually writing about the Spanish Civil War. Um, and uh, it sort of all carried on from there. But to say that there was sort of a master plan would be um, wildly inaccurate. And um, on all your books, it says at the beginning when they describe you, the thing I didn't read out, um, that you first five years were um, as an army officer. Yeah. Um, and I suppose an obvious question is, um, how important is it, do you think, for a military historian to have... Uh, worked in the military? Well, I think it can help in certain ways uh, because armies are strange organizations. Um, I think an outsider might think that they're sort of, you know, cold machines. In fact, they're intensely emotional uh, organizations. And um, one does, I think, need to uh, understand that. Um, but that doesn't mean that you've got to be. I can think of one or two excellent women uh, historians. Um, you know, Lynn MacDonald on the First World War, um, Catherine Merridale writing about the Red Army in her superb book, Ivan's War. Um, what is important is to make the effort to really get inside the boot shoes, the boots or whatever, um, of soldiers to understand rather than try to bring in your own theories from outside. I think one of the dangers we've seen has been when academics come from, say, rather different disciplines, um, attracted perhaps by the controversial nature of war, uh, and try to impose an ideological grid on a subject which basically they don't really understand. Can, can you give an example of where that well, happens? I'd, all right, yes, I can tell you what one outstanding, flagrant example in a way was Joanna Burke's um, uh, An Intimate History of Killing. Um, whereby um, the idea that sort of, you know, the, the majority of men, uh, in her view, seemed to be that they, uh, the wanted, they wanted to kill through sort of some form of um, sexual satisfaction. Now, I'm sure that's true of a tiny minority, uh, but to try to do it um, on a generalized, uh, argue that on a generalized basis, um, was actually contradicted in her own book because she was quoting some of the other mm -hmm. research, uh, which showed that the vast majority of soldiers, certainly of conscription soldiers, never even fired their rifle in battle. There are some like that in your Ardennes, aren't there? The, um, the snipers uh, who 
excelled. You, you, you actually say at a certain point they had a real talent for, for killing. So oh, yes. her I case mean, applies to, to some. There are. I mean, what was interesting is the way that the research was carried out. For example, it started, uh, there was a major Lionel Rig Wigram in the British Army in Italy in 1943, uh, who wrote with his, his analysis showed that within a platoon of about 30 men, there would be about three or four who would really do the fighting. Um, there would be about another three or four and a small handful who would try and run away at the first opportunity. And if things were going well, the, the lot in the middle would follow the fighting men. And if they weren't going badly, they'd run with the others. Uh, General Montgomery was so horrified by this, he tried to have the report suppressed immediately. But interestingly, um, the Germans found exactly the same. They divided the middle bit into two, but basically it was exactly the same schema. And so did the American research come out that way. And I was very intrigued in the Russian archives to find that um, uh, Russian officers were saying, uh, who'd found that many of their soldiers were not firing their guns at all. Uh -huh. um, they said there should be a, uh, a weapons inspection after each engagement. Anybody with a clean barrel should be executed immediately. <laughs> To go to the more general questions, y you didn't just choose history, you chose military history as your field, although I know you've written things <laughs> beyond that as well. In what role do you think military history plays in a more general understanding of human affairs? Well, Clemenceau was famous for saying that sort of, you know, uh, um, military uh, music is to um, ordinary music what uh, military law is. Oh, sorry, that's right. Military law is to ordinary law what military music is to ordinary music. Um, and the um, people may um, have that attitude towards military history. Certainly one finds there has always been a sort of an academic prejudice against uh, military history, apart from Michael Howard. Um, you know, the, 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 for example, shall we say, the British Academy has on the whole tended to be rather resistant to, say, the Hugh Strawns and others. It's amazing. Um, I think, I don't know whether to what degree it's, uh, there's an element of uh, jealousy in that particular way because military history obviously attracts more attention. Um, but I think that as a, as a subject, um, it can be analytical. You can have, um, if you like, the sort of the continental attitude towards history in a sense. Um, but thank goodness, certainly in, in Britain, I think the huge advantage has always been that all historians uh, from whatever branch they come from have always basically been influenced by the sort of narrative history of, uh, of Gibbon and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and so forth. Um, and that has tended to sort of, I think, on the whole, unify uh, history more than, say, one finds on the continent, where there is a very distinct split uh, in that particular way, and particularly obviously in Germany and also to a certain degree in, in Scandinavia, where the idea that uh, you have a thesis and then you must prove that thesis. I mean, th that can be taken to appalling degrees, like, say, Goldhagen, um, you know, selecting yeah. his quotes purely to prove his particular thesis, which actually was totally wrong. I mean, the really interesting question is um, not that all German, far from the fact of all Germans being inherently anti-Semitic, it was uh, why was uh, Germany, which was probably, the, uh, or Prussia, which was the least anti-Semitic country in Europe under Frederick the Great, um, how did it become so anti-Semitic later on? Mm. Um, you've raised something which I um, wanted to ask you about. I mean, it's clear that you're, um, you have this extraordinary number of devoted readers, um, and um, that's something <laughs> that academic historians generally don't have. Uh, I wondered, I mean, one of the questions I want to ask is, what is your, where, what do you think the state of academic history is now in Britain? But perhaps in well, Anglo, I think actually Anglo world. Well, I think, I think on the whole it's actually in a, in a, in a very healthy state because um, the really good historians um, write well. I mean, you know, um, whether um, Richard Evans, um, Ian Kershaw, um, who are not... Um, I mean, who are sort of, if you like, at the top of the, the top of the uh, pile in um, in sort of academic terms, um, but also are excellent writers, um, and I think that is more wonderful true. because it means that sort of basically. Uh, it, it gives an idea to, shall we say, the younger academics that writing jargon is not going to get them anywhere. 
um, you know, they may um, sort of impress a very, very small audience uh, in terms of the sort of buzzwords which may, they may come up with. Um, but it's certainly not going to get any further than that. I had a fascinating time with the um, um, Swedish Minister of Education, this was a number of years ago, and um, we had dinner together, and he said, you'd be very amused, you might be amused to hear what I, I'm doing tomorrow. And I said, well, tell me, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, he's called Leb Pagrovsky. And um, he said, um, well, I'm getting in all of the equivalents of your vice chancellors. Uh, because I'm going to propose that um, the government will not fund any um, uh, research in the future um, unless it is um, readable uh, and comprehensible to, if you like, the intelligent la layperson. Uh, and I said, well, good, best of luck. How you're <laughs> you ever going to manage that, I have no idea. But I thought it was an intriguing idea. Um, but anyhow, you do have, I, I don't know how many, but, but extraordinary um, readership across the world. Um, one of the questions that comes from that, apart from the books being beautifully written, um, is why do you think um, people are still so absorbed with an interest in the Second World War? I mean, there was a time, I think, when people thought the interest may fade. But oh, I certainly thought that. I mean, remember in 1995 when I was actually working in the archives in Moscow, and it was the anniversary, 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, and all the books on the subject failed to sell. And I thought, my God, I've really picked my, <laughs> picked my moment badly. Um, and then, of course, everybody was astonished. And uh, in fact, um, the interesting thing was the way that everybody then started wanting to wanting sort of answers and um, why suddenly has the Second World War suddenly taken off again and all the rest of it. And so one did have to think about it in different ways. Um, history had always been written in collective terms in the past, and it always tended to be a top-down. And then in the 1980s, we went through that sort of short period, um, which still carries on a little bit of oral history, yeah. the fashion for oral history. There were only one or two, like, say, Ronald Fraser's Blood of Spain, um, which I think really worked as, as books. Um, but in most cases, it, it lacked a context. Um, and I think I was incredibly lucky in timing uh, with the Stalingrad book, because by then I'd worked out that you know, what you really needed to do was, if you are going to um, recreate the, if you like, the experience of war to a generation which was post-military, living in a health and safety environment and all the rest of it, um, you had to somehow integrate history from above with history from below, because only in that way would you convey the consequences of the decisions of, say, Hitler and Stalin on ordinary soldiers and civilians. Um, and, um, but I think there are other reasons as well for the, in the interest in the subject, partly because, as I was saying, we live in this sort of uh, peaceful, uh, comparatively peaceful uh, world. As long uh, as we're not in the Middle East. We're not, except we're in the Middle East. I'm talking about in our sort yeah. of you know, comfort zones, comfort zones cut off from the Middle East uh, and Africa. Um, but we, as a result, I think, um, we are intrigued by what it would have been like at the time. Would we have um, had the courage uh, to refuse orders, illegal orders, to shoot prisoners or uh, civilians? Um, but above all, it's a question, I think it is a question of, it's the moral aspect, the moral choices, and there were no greater moral choices in the Second World War. And I remember um, um, Robert McCrum in The Observer in Britain um, writing um, a very good piece which put it so well, saying, you know, it's hardly surprising that people look back to a sort of period like that um, because moral choice is the basis of all human drama. And let's face it, you know, the Second World War had more Great, greater moral choices than almost mm. any, any other period in history. Another general thing I'd like to ask you about um, your history mm. is um, they are nothing if not narrative history. Mm. And there was a time, I remember, when people be were beginning to think that narrative history was old-fashioned. Um, and I know that you've, you're a great defender of, of narrative and history, and mm -hmm. you've, you've been, I, know, I think you've complained about the British school curriculum for, yes. for um, uh, well, we're uh, having, we're eroding having, the, um, having the narrative. Having a debate about it again soon, yeah. So I just wondered if you say why you think narrative is fundamental to, to the writing of history. I think it's fu fundamental to the understanding of history, apart from anything else. I mean, people may ask, you know, who do you write for and all the rest of it. Well, the answer is, you sh I think every, whether a novelist or any other historian to a certain degree, or I mean, or any writer, really, um, 
who accepts, shall we say, that history is a branch of literature, that it can't be a scientific, uh, it can't be a scientific subject as the Germans like to think. I mean, you know, history can never be tested in a laboratory, so it is a branch of literature. Um, I think that one sees really that when you actually are sitting down, you're working and so forth, what you're trying to do is to understand and to convey that understanding. Um, you can, I, th I think you can include analysis, but it's a question where you can actually include the analysis within, within, the, um, within, the, within the narrative. Uh, I don't think that you necessarily have to have separate chunks, a bit like Tolstoy in uh, uh, War and Peace, where you have to have that sort of um, little dissertation at the beginning of each yes. sort of part, which is so deeply irritating. Um, but anyway, um, no, I think that that's really the... But, um, one of the things that, uh, I mean, apart from the, the um, astonishing beauty of much of your writing, uh, there's not a paragraph uh, that's not, uh, not interesting. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the pace of the narrative, that over f 450 pages there's a driving onwards, um, which I think makes one of the reasons that people read you. But that does come at a sort of cost, doesn't it? That if you've got that pace, narrative pace, you can't pause at a certain point to consider um, more general questions. For example, one of the things I've noticed, I think is, is actually part of your success, is that you don't discuss in your books, at least the ones I've read, other historians. You don't say, this is a contentious matter and so-and-so argues this and someone else argues that. The, the, the narrative, in a way, drives on and it, it means that certain general kind of questions of let's say, historiography, can't be considered within that frame. Do you think that's...? Um, well, I'm, I, I half accept that because what I can do and what I have, have, have often done is when there are particularly contentious um, aspects of referring to that in, um, the, in the notes, um, of the different of the different points of view. I mean, what's fascinating is you can even just have the have an account of a meeting, um, and you know there can be uh, a half a dozen people present, and you have three different accounts. Yes, and none, of them, none of them, none of them. I mean, I, I th you can be very very boring if one wants to be um, by sort of you know detailing exactly what each person says. I think that you can get a reasonable uh, synthesis of the different attitudes and emphasise in your account that of course there are different versions of it. Um, if people really want to know the details then you've got the sources in the back of the book um, and they can, if they really want to, they can read all the different versions yeah. and then make up their own mind. I suppose what I'm saying is there are different kinds, I, I think if people do what I'm saying which is mm. to discuss what other historians have done, mm -hmm. it's valuable but it's one kind of work and I don't think, I, I think your works would be as it were destroyed by that impulse, that, it, that, it, that the, what the strength of what you're doing is, you know, and everyone says this who's read you, that they, that they have in part the strength of, of the novel, the, the strength of a, a story that drives on and that engrosses you and that shows you things about the world that you wanted to know. But I think a lot of this came from the fact that actually I wrote novels beforehand, um, and to a certain degree, that's the way I've sort of carried on in the w in the writing in the writing of history. Partly, as I say, because one t wants to write the sort of book what one would want to read oneself. Yeah. Um, so I, d I don't think that there's anything um, there. But I do. I don't entirely agree about about the whole of the um, point, point, point of view of sort of the narrative drive uh, in that point of view. Because, I mean, in, in nearly all of the books, um, there will be the odd chapter or whatever, which will go off to complete tangent or having to explain a background um, aspect. I mean, for example, I remember in, I mean, in Stalingrad, there's a whole chapter uh, on the sort of the potential civil war within the whole of the uh, fight on the Eastern Front. Um, because it's um, you, you know, but the which could not actually be included in um, the in in the sort of if you like in the narrative part yes. of the story. And I remember having a great um, discussion. I mean, Anne Applebaum's a very very old friend, and before she wrote her Gulag book, she showed me her um, her, her sort of synopsis or her uh, proposal. Um, and I argued that um, really she should sort of follow a chronological narrative structure. Um, and she quite rightly ignored me totally, <laughs> um, and she was triumphantly proved right yeah. that she wanted to do it entirely thematically. Yeah. Um, and I then realised afterwards that my advice had been totally wrong, and she had been completely right. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, 
It depends it's on the subject, I think. Depends on the subject. But say in Berlin, the mm. I think there's an extraordinary portrait of Hitler mm -hmm. uh, and a character portrait and, uh, and a, a deep one, but it comes in sentences or mm. paragraphs, you know, and, and the reader builds it up as in a way as a novel, uh, if you were reading a novel, that you, you get a sense of character, but there's not a kind of a chapter on the character of Hitler as you might have in another kind of book. In other words, it seems to me that you're doing within the narrative and w in the pace yes. of the narrative, the analytical... W I mean, uh, the phrase yes. I use for this is analytical narrative, which is yes. a, way, a way of seeing things um, but without sort of formally taking subjects and, you know, putting them under the microscope. But that's the way I'd like to read it myself. Not, a ju not just write it, but it was also the way I would like to read yeah. it. So, I, um, I mean, I think that we should all really write what pleases us rather than attempt to please other people. Yeah. Um, and if other people happen to like it, then so much the better. Can I ask a really um, banal question? Uh, every, everyone who is aware when they read, yeah. I mean, everyone who thinks about these things would be aware in reading a book of yours how much scholarship there is. And the variety of sources from diaries, mm. interviews with survivors in the earlier books, that, that won't happen much anymore. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the memoirs of those who are involved, so on and so on and so on. There's an enormous amount of scholarship. Um, and there's archival work which mm. takes you to places. So a really banal question, how long does it take? Well, Stalingrad and Berlin both took four years each, um, which is hardly surprising, partly because of the complications of the Russian archives. Um, and um, the games, I don't know if that's the right word, you had to play. I mean, very much the question of you were being blocked constantly, but partly because they didn't really know how to handle the situation. So um, it was really, a qu they were playing sort of scissors, paper, stone. I mean, it was a, um, a bizarre situation uh, in those days. Um, and um, so really, I mean, on the whole, it was sort of roughly three years, three years research to one year's writing uh -huh. um, in sort of crude And, and how, how much of that would be in in the archives themselves? Quite a lot. I found I could actually, I mean, the, 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 the pressure um, was so great that I could only do two or three weeks at a time in the Russian archives. Uh -huh. I mean, I just, just found I was just totally exhausted. Exhausted uh, by the material or exhausted well, exa by the... Well, both, both, and by, by the sort of the complications of, of getting at the material and so mm -hmm. forth. I mean, um, dealing, w dealing with the military archives and um, the sort of the people there and all the rest of it was um, quite a saga in itself. Uh, but um, it, 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 it was that and also, yes, the material itself was pretty, pretty crushing. Yeah. I, again, I think, uh, I'm sure a lot of people here have read your books. I think everyone would, would agree with, well, almost everyone would agree with this, that one of the most striking qualities mm -hmm. is your w novelist eye for detail. Um, you must, when you're reading archives or reading memoirs, be, be seeing the things yep. that... Um, I can just give a couple of the examples out of thousands that I could choose. Um, von Manstein's, Gen General von Manstein's attitude to Hitler um, and the Nazi regime is caught in the fact that he trained his dachshund to raise his paw on hearing the command, Heil Hitler. Just a wonderful detail that, without saying any more, one uh, finds out also he's a bit of a coward, but that's, yes. that's separate. Uh, or another, uh, again, something, uh, you know, one of the big themes of Berlin is the the shocking rape of mm -hmm. German women by the, the Red Army. And there's just one story you tell, which I'll never forget, which is a, a woman being continually, or continuously, I think the word you use, raped by Soviet soldiers. Family is in charge, you know, ha is looking after a baby, which is crying because it's hungry. They come to the um, uh, soldiers mm -hmm. and say, can you just pause in your rape so that she can breastfeed her baby? I don't know where you found it, but the most incredible no, detail. That was, that was in Vasily Grossman's notebooks. Uh -huh. um, I mean, the, the, he was, I think, almost a sort of an object lesson for any would-be journalist in to see his notebooks, which we brought out as a book later. Um, a writer ask, at war. A, about that. a writer at war. Mm. Um, you know, Grossman had this astonishing eye for detail. This is, I mean, something which I sort of so greatly admire. Mm. Um, and um, so anything like that, he would immediately, as soon as he heard a story like that or saw it for himself or whatever, he would jot it down in his notebook. Yeah. And that's why, yes, I mean, it, was a, it was, in a way, doing the book of uh, um, uh, A Writer at War was in a way a sort of almost a debt of gratitude to Grossman's own material. So it's very conscious you when you're looking at material that you're you're already imagining the way in which this will illuminate. 
It's, it's not well, just as soon as you see it, I mean, no, you, 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 have a, you have a nose, an instinct or whatever. I mean, as soon as you see something like that, you know straight away that that is actually going to tell so much more than, if you like, just the anecdote itself. Yeah. Again, I want to say something that I um, think would um, the audience here who's read you will, will understand. Mm. Uh, there was an Australian historian called Manning Clark, and he used to say historians need to write from what he called the eye of pity. And I think, uh, again, the thing that's so affecting in the books um, is the, that you, you do place the political leaders, the generals at the centre of your story, but there's so much on the effect of the war on ordinary soldiers, on prisoners of war, shockingly told really in Stalingrad mm. in particular, um, and uh, ordinary people. The absolutely unforgettable details in both Berlin and Stalingrad and in the new book on the Ardennes. Um, is that again what you're trying to do, to, to, sh to show the, yes. the consequences of decisions on Definitely to show the people. consequences of decisions. But I mean, even on a much, uh, on a, a less dramatic level, I mean, the, I think one of the great lessons that I learned uh, was back in whatever it was, it must have been about 1992, working in the French um, Archive National in Paris. And I managed finally, it took me a year to get at the archives of the DST, which was the sort of French security police. Because uh, you had to have the permission from the Minister of the Interior and all the rest of it. I mean, it was ridiculous, but um, you had to go through those hoops. And there, in just one little paragraph, was a report on a German woman, uh, the wife of a farmer, who found had been found in 1945 in Paris, having smuggled herself aboard the, one of the trains bringing concentration camp and um, forced labor uh, victims back to Paris. And she had fallen desperately in love with the French prisoner of war working on their farm, which actually would have been a death sentence for him if they'd been discovered. Uh, but she was obviously infatuated by him and had followed him back to France. She couldn't speak French. She would have been probably picked up anywhere. And she, whether she, she actually knew his address, we don't know. And of course, the big question is, we didn't even know whether he was married or not. Um, and maybe he'd returned back to France and found that his wife had had a child with a German soldier in his absence. Um, but what I found about this story, which was maybe small, in some ways slightly banal, but it actually showed that the whole of ordinary life had been completely turned upside down by the Second World War. It wasn't just a question of the dead, it was also even the survivors, yeah. their lives had been completely changed. Um, this leads me naturally to the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Sometimes, and I, I actually don't myself believe this, but I want to know what you think. Sometimes people say um, that your books uh, don't make moral judgments and that you allow the facts somehow to speak for themselves. As I say, I, I've, I've already declared myself I don't believe that to be true, but I just wonder how you, what you think about that general claim that you, as a historian, must allow the stories, as it were, to, to make themselves... Um, their moral meaning clear? Well, I believe, and I mean, obviously one can't be absolute on this, but I mean, I believe that as far as possible the duty of the historian is to understand and convey that understanding rather than to make moral judgment. Um, what I find particularly irksome today, and actually I'm involved in a little bit of a battle with the BBC at this particular moment, um, and this is actually over the reporting of um, the anniversary of Hiroshima, and I think it's sort of an interesting uh, question of to what degree one imposes or a historian tries to impose a moral judgment. I think the moral judgment should be left up to the reader. I think you should be able to pre present enough sort of information um, uh, and I hope enough details so that they can at least make up their mind in a way. But I mean, the real problem is how do you actually sort of impose moral absolutes on something which is as immoral as war? Um, the question on Hiroshima, which was a, a report on, as I was saying, the anniversary uh, by a BBC correspondent, whereby he, and I think this was a sort of good example of uh, uh, what I would describe as um, intellectual honesty as always the first casualty of moral outrage. <laughs> um, his moral outrage was so great um, that he could only talk about this as purely as a war crime. He did not uh, in any way uh, acknowledge the possibility that, uh, in fact, it saved far more Japanese lives um, than um, the number who were killed in the 
bombing in the atomic bombs. Uh, we know now that there were 28 million Japanese who'd been forced into these militias that the army was intending to force them to fight on uh, with bamboo lances and um, suicide charges, basically um, satchel charges strapped to their chest. Um, so, but it's an, if you like, as a moral question, it's a huge one. You know, uh, Was it justifiable then to drop those atomic bombs, even though Yes, one could say, objectively, it is a war crime um, because of bombing civilians. But all the major combatants in the Second World War were killing civilians. Um, but it did uh, definitely save far more lives mm. in the longer term, i.e. there would have been total famine uh, if the invasion of the home islands had been pushed off to that October and then to the following, into 1946. Um, so I, I, I think the whole question of sort of moral absolutes in, in war uh, is very different, is very a difficult one. And I think also um, what, uh, what I find deeply irritating is when people try to say, um, something which is uh, morally wrong today was morally wrong then. Now, that I think is historically illiterate in one case because it's not so much that uh, morality is not necessarily an absolute. I mean, obviously, in the earlier periods of time, people did have different attitudes. Um, one's only got to... Um, look at the way that sort of attitudes have changed over the centuries, whether towards slavery, whether towards the treatment of animals or whatever it might be. Uh, so any idea of saying, you know, what is wrong today must have been wrong then um, is actually, I think, intellectually dishonest. Uh, it's what actually Norman Davis described as a psychological anachronism. Um, and I, 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 f I find it's, it's, a, it's become much more of a problem now uh, when people are making retrospective moral, ju moral judgments mm -hmm. and not understanding what attitudes were at that particular yeah. time. I mean, I, it doesn't matter, but I actually completely agree with, you know, mm. that you distort, you lose history if, yes. you, if you impose contemporary values on, on the past, although it's a complicated question. But I just, to, I, I think the moral judgments you're making are clear through your narrative. Um, for example, I'll just give two examples. Mm -hmm. You clearly think the Wehrmacht, the German army, uh, the officers of the army were a disgrace by accepting the work of the Einsatzgruppen in the slaughter, mm. mass yes. slaughter of Jews, and you criticise them openly, mm -hmm. very often, on the one hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, some people have raised the question of the Allied mass bombings of Germany after it was clear Germany was going to be defeated as morally wrong, but I, I take it from you, you never, you don't discuss that in moral terms. You, I think you take it for granted uh, that it was uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but but you, anyhow, you don't you, you don't criticise it. In other words, I think the moral landscape of your books is pretty clear to a reader. Well, I, I don't think it's. I mean, it's not even clear to me in certain cases, you know, and I don't think it can be. It can be absolutely clear to anybody in a way uh, when one looks at it, because when one takes the say the bombing of German cities, you're quite right to raise that. Um, there, there was a military justification in the sense that not the idea that it was actually going to shorten the war because actually Harris was totally wrong about that. It didn't shorten the war from that point of view. What it did do was that it forced the Germans to withdraw their fighter aircraft from the Eastern Front to defend the Reich. And it actually um, increased, therefore, the rapidity of the Red Army advance for mm. a number of reasons. One, they suddenly got air superiority, which they never had before. Um, it also meant that um, the Germans were never able to fly reconnaissance missions over Soviet um, lines, and as a result, the Red Army was able to carry out these astonishing operations like Bagration and others um, by surprising the Germans because they couldn't actually um, reconnoiter. Now, again, I wouldn't make a moral judgment on that. Come on, say that it was right to go on bombing cities in those circumstances. No, I don't think it was, but at the same time, what is right in war? Um, I think W. But the slaughter, Sabat, the slaughter Sabat, of the Jews was, you know, was wrong, and you say it in. Yes. I don't think, well, I, don't, I mean, you know, obviously you, there are some things which are, you, you probably self-evidently so, so wrong, um, that there is no grey area. Um, and I'm not trying to pretend that I am, one can be totally objective. I mean, you know, this is where I, I disagree with the German attitude of sort of it can be somehow scientific. No historian can be totally objective. One's got to try and make an effort. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can achieve it. Can I ask you some yes. very general questions about the Second World War? Mm. Because almost no one knows more about it than you now. Uh, one is very pithy assessments of the four war leaders, Hitler, Stalin, Roosevelt, mm. Churchill. Could I ask 
Uh, yes. Um, okay, let's start with it, Roosevelt. Again, they come out of the books, but in a mm. way you don't stop and talk about that, uh, e except in paragraphs. Well, Roosevelt was always managed to give an impression of sort of a, of a caring man, um, partly because of the New Deal and a whole lot of other things. But he was also a very calculating, cold character. Um, who could be um, very, uh, very dismissive, um, and yet at the same time, um, with a great, a calculated informality um, and um, uh, charm, which he exploited quite shamelessly. Uh, what was the great paradox was, of course, that um, uh, he managed to con lots of people with his charm, but he was the one who was conned by Stalin with Stalin's charm. Char Stalin actually had great charm if he wanted to use it, uh, and he actually managed to kid Roosevelt, and that's one of the, I think, one of the great paradoxes. The other paradox, of course, was there's um, Churchill, um, who I think suffered a, a little bit from um, uh, his black dogs, but I mean the basic, basically um, uh, polarity. I mean, um, what's the phrase? You know what I mean? Um, Depression. Yes, yes. Um, and um, you're a lucky man to be able to forget about that word. <laughs> Well, no, um, but anyway, no, but he, all of his ups and downs and highs yeah. and lows and all the rest of it. Um, but what was extraordinary was the way that um, there was Churchill, who was um, sort of viscerally anti-communist, um, could at moments be also be charmed by Stalin and actually think for a, f for, for a short time afterwards that he'd really made Stalin into a real friend. Um, again, a, an extraordinary paradox uh, in, in that particular way. Um, Stalin, well, I mean, I, I did actually once ask a, a very distinguished British psychiatrist whether, what, how he would describe Stalin and how he would describe Hitler. Uh, and he thought about this and made the usual sort of disqualifications or the, the usual sort of uh, uh, caveats about sort of not having analyzed them properly, but or whatever. But he said, you know, you could be fairly sure that Stalin was a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, but in the case of Hitler, all you could say was that he had a personality disorder. Um, and I felt I'd hadn't really advanced very far <laughs> in that particular case. But it does raise an interesting question of to what degree advances in, say, science and in the understanding of the way that the brain works and to what degree we are literally the prisoner of our DNA, um, will in some way in the future, will we sort of look back and say, oh, well, poor Hitler. I mean, he was just a prisoner of um, all of these particular things, and he wasn't uh, really responsible. Um, I don't know. I think that's rather sort of a frightening idea. But what is the nature of evil? Um, is it just a sort of you know, quasi-religious uh, idea? Does it really exist uh, or not? I, I, don't think, I, I don't think I'm any closer to an answer. I don't know whether anybody else is, and I'm, I'd be surprised if they were. I do, however, agree entirely with Andre Sakharov, who said that Stalin may have killed more people, but Hitler had to be defeated first. And that is absolutely true because uh, even the Shoah, even the Holocaust, would have been overshadowed if Hitler's hunger plan um, had gone through in the way that he wanted, uh, we, if they had achieved their advance to the what was called the AA line, the Astrakhan Archangel line, um, and they had managed to wipe out through deliberate starvation the numbers of people they wanted to, 37 million or whatever it was, uh, that they wished to wipe out yeah. in that particular way. So from that point of view, Sakharov was absolutely right. Um, and again, at the end of all your books, I know one more is coming, mm -hmm. um, who um, uh, do you think are the great generals? Oh, I, I, I think Nimitz in the Pacific uh, was a great man, partly because of his mo modesty um, and genuine feeling for, um, for his own, own men and all the rest of it. Um, I think that also um, Slim in commanding the 14th Army in Burma, he was also was a great man. Uh, again, a modest man, but also one who was uh, genuinely concerned with his own soldiers. Uh, what was I found very striking in the Second World War was that, of course, here were all these generals who had been ignored throughout all the interwar years. Uh, and suddenly they were almost like film stars because the journalists, the um, newsreel crews and all the rest of it were not able to report anything about the military operations. All they could do was focus on the general. And some of them, um, uh, well, many of them were not sort of uh, swayed. Others, they found that their vanity um, sort of went into overdrive. Um, 
I, I was always fascinated by General Mark Clark, who had a, uh, a public relations team of over 50 men, um, who, in, uh, who made sure that he was only photographed from one side. He was very proud of his profile. Um, and he was so obsessed with the capture of Rome, Rome that they referred to him as Marcus Aurelius Clarkus. <laughs> <laughs> And let's face it, Montgomery was another who got completely carried away uh, in terms of sort of, you know, vanity. And MacArthur, I mean, even more so, when MacArthur had all of these uh, um, uh, matches and um, cigarette packets and so forth and uh, other things printed, which were then dropped on the Philippines saying, I will return. Um, anyway, those were the three words which, of course, every Filipino knew in English um, by the time uh, MacArthur did return. Wait, um I mean, it, with the, your most recent book, wh one of the things that I found most interesting was the, which I hadn't known much about, the struggles between uh, the American generals um, and Montgomery. Ha and Montgomery. Uh, I, uh, there's not that much which is amusing in Second World War, um, and you know, the, I didn't get that many laughs from Berlin and Stalingrad. Nice. But <laughs> I didn't either. Uh, but but I found the. The portrait of Montgomery, which is again done over the extent of the book, e extremely funny. I just wondered if, for the sake of the audience, say something about the character of Montgomery. Well, I, in one sentence in the book, which I thought was maybe I was going to get a lot of flack for it, I did suggest the possibility uh, that Montgomery um, had um, uh, high-functioning Asperger's. And um, no, in fact, interestingly, um, uh, the, 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 there were some people, of course, who got very upset about that. But um, then, actually, but Montgomery's um, step-grandson, who'd lived with him, um, unfortunately came to my aid and absolutely said no. He thought that was the best explanation for Montgomery's behavior <laughs> and, sort of and so did others. And then, of course, you find that, of course, you always think you've invented the wheel, but, of course, somebody's got there first. I then found that back in the 1980s, uh, a professor at Trinity College Dublin had written a whole paper uh, on Montgomery and high-functioning Asperger's. So um, you're, you're one's never the first one there. But um, the trouble was that uh, Montgomery did have a simply fatuous vanity. Um, there was an extraordinary moment when he went to Buckingham Palace and he said to the King's private secretary as he sort of took off his berry, he said, you look, see my hat? He said, um, when my soldiers see that in the distance, um, they say, there's Montgomery and they're prepared to fight anybody. It, my hat's worth three divisions. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, you think, how can anybody take somebody like that seriously yeah. if they're capable of that sort of remark? The trouble was that um, Britain didn't have very many heroes in the Second World War. Um, and of course, the press um, immediately as a result of Alamein and all the rest of it, turn Montgomery into a hero. And uh, as Britain's sort of place in the world uh, ebbed away in a very humiliating fashion in 1944, um, of course, the Americans were basically paying for the whole thing. Um, and we were also suffering manpower problems and all the rest of it. Uh, the British press were basically insisting that Montgomery should take over as ground forces commander and all the rest of it. And he wasn't making life any more easy for uh, Eisenhower. I mean, Eisenhower actually should have been tougher and basically put him back in his box. but. Um, uh, unfortunately, he didn't, feeling that because of the alliance, he couldn't be he couldn't be too rough and rude. My, my, my reading of it was that in, uh, there was quite considerable tension between the American and, and British yes. generals. Oh, yeah. um, but my but reading no, of no, it was that it was almost entirely Montgomery's fault. Oh yes, it was. <laughs> oh, it was. Um, I mean, the way he humiliated General Bradley totally unnecessarily. Um, I mean, I don't think Bradley actually performed very um, impressively in the Ardennes. Uh, of that, though, I think there's no doubt. Um, but I mean, m the way that Montgomery humiliated him was totally unnecessary. Um, and um, as, as in fact, in fact, when Mount Eisenhower felt that he had to give Montgomery command over the Americans in the north because Bradley um, stuck down south of the bulge, uh, couldn't get in contact. Uh, even one of Montgomery's staff officers described Montgomery arriving at the American First Army headquarters uh, like Christ coming to cleanse the temple. <laughs> um, on a move to a much more serious matter, you. Um, I think of all your the, the books, the political kind of controversy that's most followed is the one concerning the behaviour of the Red Army mm. uh, in in, in um, Prussia and then in mm. Germany, I mean the, the rest of Germany. Um, you say up to two million German women may <laughs> have been raped. Um, I, ju I just wonder for the audience if you could say the claim had has had both an incredible effect in Russia and in, in Germany, mm. but a different one. 
this say something about the reaction to, to what's, what's written well, in so, uh, really some grueling detail in, in your well book. the figure of two million in fact is not mine it came from Helke Sander who is a, um, a German feminist um, historian and filmmaker uh, who I think did an excellent um, did excellent work and research in into it uh, now obviously one can never statistically can never be accurate but I found that when going into when uh, we worked in the Russian archives uh, and we saw the details uh, on the reports by the NKVD rifle regiments, which were then sent to Beria, who then passed them on to Stalin, um, the figure was prob not exaggerated. I mean, this was describing um, the numbers of uh, German women committing suicide because they couldn't face, face it anymore, killing their children as well beforehand. Um, which gave one an idea, if you like, of the scale. Now, obviously, there were little pockets which were bypassed or whatever, but you've only got to read not just the German accounts, but I say the Russian accounts. Uh, Natalia Gesser, a Soviet journalist with the Red Army, who was a great friend of Sakharov, I mean, she described it as an army of rapists. Now, that is actually unfair in a certain way because not all of them were. There were um, devout communists who were horrified by what they were seeing. I mean, who genuinely did not feel that this was right. Um, what, I, what struck me, um, and this okay, was anecdotal, but one got it from um, Grossman as well as other sources, and also from German sources, that quite often it was Jewish officers who had more reasons for revenge than almost anybody, uh, Jewish officers in the Red Army, who did tried to do more to stop the rape and the maltreatment of German women um, than almost anybody else. Uh, we think of Stalinist society as being sort of totally controlled, but actually the Red Army was completely out of control. Helke Sander in her book, in fact, sort of said that the British Army um, uh, raped the least by a long way, but I don't think she quite understood why. Um, and it wasn't anything to do with sort of bromide in the tea or anything like that. It was because the system, going back to the old days of the idleness of officers, meant that the NCO system in the British Army was far tougher than in any other mm -hmm. army. And so as a result, they didn't allow soldiers to go wandering off on their own. Mm. Um, and that's why it, but in the Red Army, there was no sort of NCO system at all, actually, or they were very, very weak, um, and there was very little control over the soldiers. So in the evening, as soon as they started drinking, then they went off hunting. Yeah. And just say something about the reaction <coughs> in Germany and in Russia to the claims in, in Stalingrad about well, the women. Uh, well, the reaction in Russia was um, ferocious. I was um, even, funny enough, even before the book came out, the uh, Russian ambassador in London, uh, Grigory Karazin, uh, condemned me for lies, slander, and blasphemy against the Red Army, which was a very interesting concept in itself. Um, actually, it was quite funny, I have to say. Oh, God, we're rather running over, aren't we? Um, um, it was rather funny in a way because um, the, the, then the German ambassador suddenly suggested that he should give the launch party with his friend <laughs> Grigory Karazin. I said, Ambassador, I don't think that's a very good idea. You should read the book first. Uh, anyway, he read the book and then rang me in a panic, simply saying, um, he said, I can't understand now what you say. He said, I can't even give you a party on my own. You see, my next posting is Moscow. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, the, but the reaction in Germany obviously tended to be a much more of a positive one. But in Russia, uh, I am now, as a result of Sergei Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, getting this law through, uh, I am liable to um, five years' imprisonment in Russia. Really? Um, yes, they brought, brought through this uh, law. He tried to bring it through um, in 2009 when he was uh, minister. Isn't it wonderful for a title? He was minister for emergency events. And um, he tried to get it through on the grounds. He said that any criticism of Red Army in the Second World War is um, the equivalent of Holocaust denial, which I, again I thought was an interesting uh, concept, especially since Stalin was the first Holocaust denier. Um, and um, then um, he brought it through just about a year ago, uh, just over a year ago, in fact, a year and a half ago. Does that mean you can't I turn to Russia? Way, and my, I'm afraid my Russian publishers are in an absolute stew because they were about to bring out a new translation of the Berlin book themselves. Um, and obviously, you know, it's far too risky, far too dangerous for them. Uh, uh, apparently, I mean, I've read that German opinion was very favorably. Mm -hmm. uh, is that affected by the, the well, an, I mean, an I acknowledgement I from outside? Well, I, of, of I was very claim. struck. I was very struck by all of the messages I started getting from German women, um, some of whom had actually been raped. I mean, we interviewed quite a few. We interviewed a lot during the um, research for the book. Uh, but I, then afterwards, one got 
even more afterwards, simply saying um, nobody dared, we, none of us dared speak about it at the time afterwards because it would have upset our families so much. I could never admit it to my children and all the rest of it. But now that it's out sort of in the open, um, one can acknowledge it. And I remember a sort of somebody at Reuters, who I didn't know, sort of said, you know, it's amazing now the number of people who suddenly acknowledge that actually they or their brother, in fact, were the product of mm. rapes. Um, the, uh, we we are running it, but I, there are, uh, I think you predict that the Aden book will or ought to cause uh, a smaller but nevertheless real controversy, and that is something that, that you detail, which is that not only did um, American troops shoot prisoners of war, in perhaps because they knew of the shooting of their own prisoners of war by the Germans at Malmedy, um, but also the generals, the US generals, knew about and encouraged. Mm. Uh, do you think there will be a, a response to this? I, I have a f in my bones tell me that opinion is now so um, kind of used to horrendous acts on all sides. Well, you may ma they may there may not be much response to it, but I just wondered what... Well, you may be right. I mean, what I find, um, I find very striking is that um, I think that the Vietnam War was such a sort of moral mess, quagmire, really, for the Americans, that the whole question of the greatest generation, this slight sentimentalization almost of the sort of the war period, the war generation, uh, meant that sort of, you know, uh, rather like sort of, you know, the US Marine Corps, it's like the third rail, touch it and you're dead type thing um, in Washington. Um, I, I felt that sort of maybe I might get a very, very strong reaction in that particular way. I think that you're probably right. Um, but in the past, and I do find it very striking, um, no American historian has actually mentioned, for example, the massacre at Chernoin, which the Americans carried out, um, partly because everybody had fulminated so much about the Malmedy massacre by the, by the Waffen SS. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask two final questions. Um, That's not allowing anybody else much of a chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, w um, I didn't look at the clock in time, so <laughs> I apologise. But uh, people can buy your book, I think, and ask you questions. Yes, signing. Um, I'm a bit like President Ford. I can't chew gum and sort of walk at the same time. I can't sign books and answer <laughs> questions at the same time, but I'll right. do my best. Um, just one criticism made by Neil Ferguson um, of, of your books is, and really more the readers than the books maybe, that, that people, he says, are titillated by extreme violence. And that's why your books sell so well. Um, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but... Well, uh, yes, he accused, well, on air, he accused uh, Max Hastings and me of writing war pornography. Um, and, um, I mean, and of being controversial, whatever. And as Max said, you know, Neil, coming from you, controversial, that's rich. Um, and interestingly, um, as when the um, uh, microphones were turned off afterwards, um, Neil leant across and he said, and what more, what's more, neither of you quoted my book. <laughs> so, hell hath no fury like an academic unquoted, which I thought was terribly funny. Um, but apparently the, the, apparently the BBC received a number of emails afterwards saying, did Beaver and Hastings kick the shit out of him in the car park <laughs> afterwards? <laughs> But the um, you're not affected by the criticism. I mean, I, 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 I think it's absurd myself because. Uh, but I, I just wondered why it someone as, in I, as intelligent as Neil Ferguson should have said such a thing. Listen, there are certainly there have been passages which I felt I, 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 which I did leave out. I mean, Catherine Meridale was a wonderful help to me on the Berlin book because um, you're so close to the material by the time you finish it. And certainly when it was dealing with the rapes, um, it's such a controversial area. I mean, she said to me, Anthony, actually, you, Anthony, you realize you're going into a minefield. She said, you've got to because, you know, you've got very important material here. Um, because basically you'll find that there will be a, a number of feminist historians who will believe that sort of no man has the right to write about the subject. Um, but she was, I'd say, say, a huge help of sort of, you know, basically getting me to clarify some of the things and thought and all the rest of it. Um, but you do need it when you're talking about and writing about such appalling subjects. Um, and some things are sometimes sort of so horrific that you can't really even sort of put them in. I mean, particularly the way that the women sometimes would um, try to kill their children beforehand, but in the end, by cutting their wrists, would do it the wrong way and you're just crippling them. I mean, you know, there's, there's some things which are just sort of, you can't. It was bad enough already. Um, final question. Um, 
George Orwell wrote a thing, uh, an essay once called Why I Write, mm. and so I'm going to ask you why you write. And I, I wondered, do you write um, in part because you hope people will learn something from history? Uh, the horror of war, I think, is... Yes. Um, but also, but above all, you, um, one writes to understand oneself. I mean, I think, you know, there are still lots of things like we were talking about earlier about sort of, you know, does, does evil exist? And basically, one has to understand human motivation, but one can never generalize about it because you find, and my God, the Second World War, you have every paradox, every contradiction imaginable. Um, you can't generalize, but at the same time, you still do want to try to understand why people act in the way they do. And do, do you think people learn from history? Well, B Bismarck famously said, the only thing we learn from history is that nobody learns from history. Um, but that was a sort of typical irritating remark which he used, used to make. Um, but I think that there are things, yes, we can certainly learn from it. What I do think is dangerous, though, is the way that politicians um, tend to refer, especially to the Second World War, um, purely when they want to sound sort of grandstanding and so forth, and that's very dangerous because the historical parallel is actually one of the most dangerous things one can indulge in. Munich. Well, not just Munich. I mean, you know, whether um, Anthony Eden referring to Nasser as Hitler, just as Tony Blair calling, referring to sort of Saddam Hussein as Hitler, or, you know, George Bush referring to 9-11 as Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, it distorts absolutely everything, yeah. and above all, also even strategic thinking. We have to... Yes, I know. We better shut up now. Better we? shut up now. <laughs> Can I say... Uh, <laughs> well, well, I don't I know whether they might want, want, probably want us to I want to chuck I us out I now. I, I, don't I think I think we're not. Well, can we? Are we allowed to ask some? Que have some questions asked at this time? Two, right? Okay. Um, there, there is a mic coming up, so I should have given more time. Uh, Anthony, what are you writing about next? Um, very quickly, Arnhem. Uh, I tried to fit it in. I mean, I tried to do a chapter and a half on it in the introduction to the Arden book, uh, but it was a waste there, and I felt that it's such an important subject in itself. So I'm taking that out and I'm doing that entirely as a separate book. Anybody else? Oh, gosh, we got... Uh, well, we got... Uh, was that that, was, that was only half a question. Yes, it's okay. All right. Uh, it was a very... I'm trying to be very quick in my replies. Yes. Is there a topic you would never write about but that you would love to? Well, one of the reasons, um, I don't know about I'd love to, but I mean, for example, the Iraq war, it'd be very hard now to write about modern warfare as a historian simply because so much of the material is digital. I mean, it can be wiped, and it is being wiped. I mean, we've only got to look at Hillary, Hillary's emails or um, the way that they're using private um, servers and so forth. Um, and in the old days, it's actually also the problem is Freedom of Information Act. Because journalists are trying to write history on the hoof the whole time, um, the pressure is therefore much more on generals, ministers, whoever are involved, officials involved, uh, to delete the material before it goes to the archives. In the old days, the papers were boxed up, they went off to the archives, and 30 years later, they were opened up. Uh, that at least meant the material was preserved, but now both the digital aspect and um, the pressure on the decision makers uh, means actually that I think that the truth in the future will be that much more difficult to get at, and I think that's very worrying. Yes, very last one then. This is the last question. Is there any prospect of a work dealing with the Pacific or Asian theatres? Um, I covered it obviously in the whole of the s book on the whole of the Second World War. Um, but I don't think so from the simple point of view that um, to do the, the sort of book that I would like to do, I would like to be able to get at the archives on the other side. And, you know, the Japanese archives, frankly, and let alone the Chinese archives, but the Japanese archives are an absolute nightmare in that particular way. I mean, uh, I was telling Robert earlier, I mean, Ian, Ian, uh, <coughs> Ian Kershaw said, said, to, said to me, um, you know, uh, you thought the Russian archives were difficult, you try the Japanese. I mean, which he tried with his book on uh, fateful decisions. Um, but there are some young Japanese historians who are starting to do some very good work in that particular way, but I wouldn't be able to get in there or actually do anything. So as a result, I just don't feel I'd be make a good enough job of it. Um, I, I think many people in the audience are readers of Anthony Beaver, um, not only for today, but much more generally, we are deeply in your debt. I thank you very much. Robert, I'm in yours. Thank you so much. <laughs>